Well, good afternoon from St. Louis and hello to you wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School. Delighted to welcome you to today's program. For those of you joining on the Zoom webinar, you likely know this, but we can't see or hear you and we can't call on raised hands, but chat is enabled. Many of your fellow Open Classroom classmates have already said hello in the chat, and we do want this to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to post questions and comments throughout. I want to extend a welcome to anybody joining us through the YouTube live stream or perhaps viewing this recording at a time that's more convenient for you. I want to make you aware that we're not able to moderate any Q&A through YouTube, though. Uh, so, at this point in our program, I want to pass the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Sarah Birch, our Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment, uh, give us an idea of what's coming up with Open Classroom. Thanks, Janet, and welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining. Really excited to be here with you all today and want to give a special welcome to those among the audience who are prospective students or maybe even perhaps admitted students at this point. We're really glad that you joined us today. Um, this has been such a fun series that we started this uh, spring semester called Curriculum Showcase, where we are featuring faculty from across our programs um, who offer you know really unique perspectives from their concentration or specialization area of expertise. And so uh, we have one more of this series coming up next week and then another one later. Uh, but next week, you can expect one from Vanessa Fabre at Open Classroom on March 8th, uh, which will be called A Queer Perspective on Successful Aging. On March 9th, there is an open classroom entitled Dropping the Headpan for Better Educational Opportunities, the case of girls in Northern Ghana at risk of dropping out of school for child labor. And on March 10th, um, finally, customer choice models versus machine learning, finding optimal product displays. So as you can see, a very wide array of topics being discussed, and we hope that you'll join us for any and all that you're able to. Um, with that, I will turn it back to Janet to introduce today's speaker. Thanks so much, Sarah. So today we are joined by Ellis Ballard. Ellis is an assistant professor of the practice here at the Brown School and director of the Social System Design Lab. His research and teaches, teaching focuses on advancing participatory approaches to system dynamics modeling with communities and group model building practice methods in cross-cultural contexts. Ellis is the specialization chair for the Brown School System Dynamics Specialization. He teaches courses in community-based system dynamics, designing sustainable policies and programs, um, and advanced skills labs. He's here to talk to us about systems models and causal maps, representing and transforming mental models to affect social change. Please welcome our friend Ellis Ballard. Great, thank you all, and um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I um, I love the chance to share out ideas and work and the incentive to create something new, um, and which is what I did. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and making sure that works. Super. Um, and so as, as Jeanette said, um, I am here as faculty member, as well as the director of the Social System Design Lab. And we've got a sort of weird little niche here at the Brown School focused on um, a specific practice of community-based system dynamics modeling. And the sort of what does that mean? How does that work? How do we do it ourselves is a larger topic than a one hour presentation with discussion. Um, but what I wanna do is zero in on a specific idea that's undergirding uh, system dynamics work and system change work and system mapping work, which is ideas of mental model transformation. And so what I'm going to do is um, talk about a couple of key points, and then hopefully we'll have an opportunity for discussion at the end. So I'm going to hit this sort of set up the challenge of managing complexity, talk about mental models and metaphors, and then talk about system map models and causal maps as tools for representing and transforming mental models. And then talk a little bit about what does it look like to dive deeper with a specific emphasis on the Brown School. Um, 
and, and then we'll open up for discussion. Um, and so my goals in this next, I don't know, hopefully 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more, is to sort of explore the role of metaphors and mental models in how people act within complex policy problems and program problems. Um, I will also am looking to highlight the work of Brown School alums and community partners who use system dynamics. So I'll, I'll highlight a couple of projects that I've been involved in, but really want to emphasize the work of other people because um, there's a broader community than just faculty members here doing this work. And then for you admitted students or you potential students, I want to plant seeds of interest because there's a lot of really unbiased but cool system dynamics coursework to pursue here at the Brown School. And that's part of what we're here for as well. So um, yeah, we'll dive in. There'll be a couple points where I'll ask you, ask folks if they have sort of ideas or, or and we can add them to the chat, but I'll probably just sort of blast through and, and then we'll open it up for discussion afterward. So um, let's start with the challenge of managing complexity. Um, and so one of the underlying premises of my work, and I think this is, I hope this is true of a lot of folks who are working in social work, public health, and social policy spaces, is that most of the challenges we're working with are complex. They're like this tangled ball of yarn. There are these knots and interwoven threads of people, factors, ideas, policies, and this web exists in such a way that it's not going to be solved just by brute force. If we want to disentangle this web, find meaning, discover um, where each end is, we can't just pull harder on these purple and the red ball. If we do that, that knot will just get tighter. Right? And so that's a characteristic of complex problems, where there's not just one silver bullet solution, there's not just one sort of key to unlocking. We have this interconnected web that is um, nature of the problem and part of its barrier to creating change. And an important distinction I want to make here to start out with is what we mean by complex. So often there's a, a um, conflation of the term complicated and the term complex. Complicated systems are like this Rube Goldberg device that you can see the video of. Um, it's a situation where there's a lot of moving parts and sort of dynamic behavior and interest, but the overall system is tightly calibrated and tightly controlled in which there's high regulation about what are the individual parts and good understanding of how they'll behave. So in, in this Rube Goldberg device, um, we have all of these components of di di dominoes and spoons and marbles, but it is designed in such a way that everything is predictable. So if we can just manage all these parts in sequence, um, then we'll be able to create a solution. And often that's what people think about as complex problems. If we just understand all the rules in isolation, we can um, manage the system. But I would propose um, that what we're actually working with when we're talking about social system problems and public health problems is complex systems. These are situations where there are multiple little parts all interacting like in a complicated system, but all of those parts are also changing, evolving. The rules of the game are evolving along with the parts. And so this is a photo from some climate change pro or a, 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 a gift from climate change protests. And these are complex systems. These are situations in which there are multiple actors who are all interacting, but as they interact, they learn, they adapt. It's creating new information, new behavior, um, where the system tr fundamentally transforms. And this distinction, it's, it was highlighted by Harry Rudder and, and Peter Hoffman, my former colleague, um, is interested in these ideas too. This distinction is really important. Because if we are acting to support or address um, or amplify a social protest movement that has all of these characteristics of evolution and adaptation, but we're acting as if they're a Rube Goldberg device where everything is predictable and controllable, we will very quickly get in over our head. 
we'll very quickly get into a situation where we're intervening um, and the system is moving in the wrong way. And so one of the questions that people ask all the time is saying, okay, yeah, totally, Ellis, systems are complex, but what do I do about it? <laughs> How do we make sense of it? Are you just saying we just need to keep on studying all our lives to make sure we understand each individual part um, in order to manage the whole? And what I wanna propose, this is a foundational concept of, of systems thinking work and system dynamics work, is that rather than saying, how do we control systems? What we wanna focus on is how do we understand the mental models of those systems and the metaphors that people use to manage and make sense of that complexity. That that's actually the target of systems change work acting on the mental models and the beliefs and the, the, the understandings of people acting in these complex systems. And the key I want, idea I want to sort of propose and then unpack is this idea of metaphors. Um, the work of um, Johnson and Laird, the work of um, Lakoff, there's a bunch of folks who have written about the idea of metaphors as tools for making sense of complex reality. And if we think about examples of referring to political earthquakes, we're talking about a political change or a, um, an election or a protest through the metaphor of an earthquake that implies all sorts of different ideas about where did this come from? What was the precipitating buildup of pressure within tectonic plates that suddenly emerges in an instant um, in the result of an election or a protest, right? The metaphor of an earthquake is a way of organizing and making sense of and creating meaning in complex political change. We also talk about metaphors of war and combat and battles in terms of cancer, for instance, saying mobilizing military metaphors to connote or imply the importance of big groups of people working together, the idea of mobilizing effort um, above and beyond what is normal to address a foe, also the idea of push and pull and combat, right? We use these metaphors to try to succinctly contain an understanding of a complex reality like political change and cancer that is too big to fully understand. And what I wanna propose is that our use of metaphors, they offer a, sh a shorthand to help us communicate um, about complex realities without having to talk about all the details, help us make sense of complex scenarios, help us and help us develop heuristics for how to act in new situations. We develop these metaphors as a way to mobilize action. And the premise of system dynamics that, that, that I work on is that these metaphors, they both reflect and they inform our underlying mental models of what these complex problems are and how they came to be. And the idea is that all of us um, operate, our cognition is working through this idea of a mental model. We have these internalized, simplified representations of external realities that operate in our head. They're images, they're drawings, <laughs> they're, they're pictures of reality that we use to interact and interpret the world around us. We all have our mental models of how the world works. And those mental models inform the metaphors we use, the way we talk about problems, but also they are informed by the metaphors we use and we hear in our environment. And so Lakoff and Johnson, they, they, they argue this quite succinctly and I really like this idea. They say the concepts that govern our thought are not just matters of the intellect. They also govern our everyday functioning down to the most mundane details. Our concepts, our mental models, structure what we perceive, how we get around in the world, and how we relate to other people. 
And this is basically a theory of the mind. It's not the only theory of the mind. There's other sort of ideas about how cognition works, but, but this is a sort of a, one of the threads that is really um, influential in this systems change and systems modeling work that I'm involved in. And I wanna unpack a couple of examples that around mental models and the implications of um, certain mental models on how we might act. So this, I, one of the, the metaphors that's used in practice um, that we see in the news, we see um, all over the place is this idea of tidal waves of migration. Right? We mobilize this idea of a tidal wave of migration. This is used in news, this is used in politics. Um, and what if we unpack the implications of that metaphor? What does that tell us about folks who use that metaphor's underlying mental model? If we under, unpack the idea of a tidal wave, we think about this as something that's uncontrollable. We think about this as something that's dangerous. We think about this as something that has to be fled Right? That's the implication of the, the word tidal wave. It's a natural disaster. Tidal waves are natural disasters. And if that's the connotations, if that's reflecting sort of the underlying belief of what is migration, what does that tell us about empathy for the humanity of people migrating? Right? That's a metaphor that's used that's dehumanizing people who are moving from one place to another that isn't asking about what does it mean to focus on integration, inclusion, or belonging and evolution of a community, right? The underlying mental models of migration that give rise to metaphors of tidal waves are assuming that migration is a danger, right? Assuming that that is incommensurate with the sustainability of this town. And that matters, right? Both the use of that metaphor and the ways that it influences other people and the way they interpret the ideas of migration, as well as um, the mental model itself, that matters in terms of policy, in terms of community, in terms of what it means to be welcoming and accepting and embracing of, of community change. In maybe a more nuanced idea, what if we think about the idea of the STEM pipeline science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM pipeline. There's some really interesting work and it's featured in a news article, but there's a bunch of research papers about this too. Taking issue with the idea of using pipeline metaphors when we talk about what does it mean to strengthen the engineering workforce in the United States, that we use this pipeline metaphor to talk about supporting people early. Um, what if we, we, we use this pipeline to talk about getting people in an elementary school and cultivating their learning and so that they can move into high paying and high impact STEM jobs as adults. But that metaphor also implies that there's only one pathway in, that you need to start early, that this is a track that you get on when you are in fifth or sixth grade. And if you don't do that, you don't have a place because you weren't part of that pipeline. You weren't part of this, this system. It also talks about how if, if pipeline metaphor implies that a leakage is detrimental, it's damaging because of course an oil pipeline leakage is detrimental. It's damaging to the larger environment. But if we employ pipeline metaphors to inform our strategy, then that implies that our work in supporting support workforce development and supporting careers for youth um, is about say, how do we make sure people stay the course? How do we make sure they're shooting through this pipeline and becoming productive members of society rather than thinking about leakage as being healthy, rather than thinking about multiple pathways to fulfilling and successful jobs, right? So and again, the metaphors we're using reflecting mental models of what is the strategy for managing careers? And the final one I wanna talk about is from colleagues in New Zealand, um, Ihi Heke and, and other colleagues who talk um, in this article about the metaphors we use and the ways we employ language around healthcare. And they talk about sort of Western ideas of patient-centered care are metaphorical. 
that there aren't literally patients at the center of every decision, who aren't making the, all the decisions, but it's, it's a metaphorical language. And that precludes alternative views of what should be at the center around community-centered care. It precludes ideas of healthcare and community care that centers indigenous traditions and ways of knowing and ways of being. That's what um, these authors argue, right? That we employ this, this language and it becomes so institutionalized that it, it does work of precluding options that we can't even necessarily always think about. And so the key points of this, this setup is that the simpl simplifications of our mental models and use of metaphors help us to make sense of, to describe, and to communicate about the complex problems that we are interested in addressing. But the problem at the same time is that we can be lulled into complacency. We can employ metaphors that and, and have underlying mental models that are incomplete, that are oppressive, <laughs> that fail to examine the implications, the gaps, or the biases of these mental models. And those, that complacency translates into how policies are made, what is prioritized, what is funded, how people mobilize their power. And so the premise I want to talk about is saying, what if we were to think about mental models not just as static, but as dynamic and changeable? What if we were to unpack our mental models, unpack our use of language, make the implications of them explicit, learn from them and transform them? And so system models and causal maps are tools, and this is, this is my work, for representing and unpacking and transforming mental models that inform how people act in the world. And so I like to think about it in this way, that we have our complex reality that's a big mess. And that informs our own simplifications, our mental pictures, our shorthands, our metaphors for, for how we interpret that reality. And those metaphors, those mental models, inform and constrain and dictate what decisions we take. And then that creates change in reality, right? So we have this action and reflection loop. What I wanna propose is saying, what if we create a second loop? This is not my idea alone about double loop learning, to be clear. <laughs> what if we create this second loop? What if we create a learning loop where we examine our mental models? We represent them, we interrogate them, we share them, we unpack them, and then we improve them to change how we even make sense of the world, to generate new metaphors. This is a simple causal loop diagram talking about police use of force, sort of hypothesizing what is the system structures that might give rise to police use of force. And so this is really the mission, um, I would argue, of systems mapping and system modeling. How do we create a second process for thinking, reflecting, slowing down and making sense of our, and improving our mental models? And so there are lots of tools to do that. Um, there's traditions of rich pictures um, that talk about sort of diagramming and visual based um, representations of a phenomenon. There's other traditions of mind maps that um, sort of think about the branching of proximate and distal causes. And the tools that I'm really interested in is system dynamics tools, which are doing the same thing. And system dynamics tools start to unpack what are the factors that contribute to a change in the system? And not just what are the factors, but how are they interconnected? And how are the chains of cause and effect giving rise to this complex reality we see? And I'm not gonna unpack all of the tools of system dynamics modeling here, but the two major pieces here are causal loop diagrams here on the left, which is a qualitative drawn diagram about links and loops that give rise to a problem. And then simulation models, which are 
more formal mathematical representations to try to make sense of what are the mental models of people operating a system and how do they work and what are the implications of them. And we can think about this as used in practice using qualitative mapping for dialogue, for bringing together multiple voices to say, what is your picture of the world? What is my picture of the world? How do we um, unpack and explore the system that we are all experiencing together? We can also think about the use of interactive model interfaces where we are exploring what if questions about what if we act here? What if we act there, right? So these are tools for creating space and platforms and structure to make mental models explicit and to negotiate them. And some uses of these types of tools are to expose differences in mental models, to interrogate assumptions and implications of those mental models, to refine and build and create new collective mental models that people can act on, and to negotiate and to develop consensus. If there are differences, how do we start to paint a common picture? And so community-based system dynamics, the, the practice that, I, that we teach here at the Brown School, um, and that a lot of folks engage in in their own work, is a structured approach to naming and defining what is that jumble of thread? What is that complex problem? And then using diagramming tools to map out the underlying structure that gives rise to the problem in the form of a causal map or simulation model. And then use that understanding, that mapping, to analyze, to say, what does this commonly developed model tell us about our own reflections, our own ways of thinking and ways of doing things in the past and new opportunities that maybe we wouldn't have thought about alone and help inform perspectives of how to solve that problem in the future. And our tradition here at the Brown School is focused on saying, how do we invest in capabilities to explore these tools, um, not relying on professors <laughs> to do it, but to have that be integrated into um, practice within communities themselves. So I want to give two brief examples of how this has worked um, and then talk about what does it look like to dive deeper. So um, one of the classes we teach is about the practice of participatory modeling and mapping, the facilitation of this collective diagramming activity. And so this is a spotlight from a project a number of semesters ago implemented in collaboration with folks at Jennings High School here in the St. Louis region, up in Jennings, north of here. Um, and they were, the project that they were, a problem they're trying to explore was they were looking at mental models of college readiness and college ambition. Because as a district, the school, of course, is interested in saying, how do we promote opportunity for higher education for our students? And the student group, whose names are here, um, they led these modeling and mapping sessions with groups of teachers and with groups of students to say, what's your mental model of the system that's creating college attendance and college readiness? Um, and the, on the left was, is, is the output of the teacher model, and on the right was the output of the student model. And I'm not going to go through point by point here, but part of what's really exciting, I think, about this work um, was that what it revealed was a fundamental difference in how teachers and students were understanding the components that comprise the system and where the potential levers were. The students were really operating, or the teachers were really operating from a mental model around what are the tools at our disposal? How do we think about leveraging the school system in order to promote educational attainment, which is I think a very reasonable and rational way to do that. And students, they said, yeah, that's a bit of the story, but their interpretation of this challenge was way outside of the boundaries of the school itself. They were thinking about school as just one little part. And that created a bunch of aha moments about folks are acting on these mental models that may be actually um, at cross purposes. The other end of the spectrum um, is work of uh, an alum from the Brown School, Kelsey Werner, um, with teams from the Jesuit Re Refugee Service um, working in Kenya. 
Um, and what they were working on was saying, how do we, might we leverage tools of system mapping and community-based system dynamics to support community-driven program design in emergency contexts? And so for this work, um, the team created a set of these mapping and modeling workshops with parents and families and teachers and educators within the Kukuma refugee camp in Northern Kenya to explore what are the um, system drivers that lead to inclusion of kids with disabilities and other special needs to um, in education opportunities and started to map out where are there aligning and differ differing mental models of education, priority of education, um, sustainability of organizations from the perspective of all these different groups and use that to inform a synthesis model here um, and really unpack using that common vision, that common mental model that was developed and negotiated to inform organizational prioritization for what is the development and scale up of this program actually look like and then taking it on to do it in practice. So those are just two examples of, of how we think about this idea of unpacking critiquing and leveraging mental models to, to support change. And so what I wanna do is close with um, opportunities to dive deeper into these concepts. So first, the social system design lab um, here at the Brown School, our work is really to develop the science and the application of these tools for work in human services and communities. And so we have a body of research and practice around systems modeling and system mapping tools um, here in the St. Louis, around the US and globally. We also teach um, at the Brown School formal coursework um, in system dynamics modeling. Um, I'm actually, one of my classes just started, I'm gonna show up late because uh, of, of this presentation, um, but also guest lectures, short courses, institutes. Um, and we support community practice, so collaborations with organizations through course-based collaborations as well as project-based collaborations to, to implement this work and to develop the practice. Um, and we have a set of materials. Um, this is something that's sort of a new endeavor of the Social System Design Lab to say, how do we um, share out the principles, the tools, the techniques that we use in our own practice so that they're widely available, free to use and to adapt. Um, and thinking about this as, I'm gonna put this in the chat, um, as a way to sort of refine and expand. There's another batch that's actually um, responsive to your question, Sherry, about virtual meetings and participatory approaches um, that I'm probably gonna make live tomorrow once I can carve out some time. Um, but a set of methods briefs to say, what does it look like to take this into our own work? But also I wanna highlight that this kind of work is really done by not just an academic space, not just requires um, master's degrees um, and academic settings to do this work. This is something that's sort of an active community of practice here in St. Louis. And I wanna highlight a handful of folks who are friends and colleagues and partners who are leading their own work around this um, that, that I learn a huge amount from and I think is really exciting. Dr. Saris Chung at SKIP designed um, a strategy tank here in St. Louis around education transformation. Dr. Nishesh Shalis at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis leading community research there. Sarah Pritchard from the Implementation Science Center for Cancer Control here, who's leading a really interesting work on diversity, equity, and inclusion, applications of system dynamics. Halliday Douglas, working with sons and daughters of St. Louis, thinking about um, trans change transformation using systems and collaborative and community-driven techniques. And Kaylin Richardson from the Early Learning Partnership from Eastside Aligned, um, working on parental readiness in St. Louis. All these folks are taking these concepts and tools and integrating them into their own work. Um, and so really what I want, hope folks will take away is um, a perspective around what if we were to slow down, pause, unpack our metaphors and our mental models about why problems exist, interrogate them, draw pictures of them, get them down on paper so that they can breathe and be explored from a distance. Um, because I think independent of all of the techniques of modeling, mapping, diagramming, mathematical computations, 
that go into the, the practice of this, that fundamental seed of saying, what if our mental models are incomplete? What if our mental models um, imply ideas about the world and courses of action that are detrimental, that are ineffective, um, starting from that possession of introspection, reflection, and interrogation, I think is a fundamental seed of systems change work. And to close, I'll just acknowledge none of this is all my own. Um, I, you know, I learned from a whole big group of people. Uh, a lot of Peter Hovman's work around foundations of community-based system dynamics, drawing on work of Max Black and Ludwig Wittgenstein is quite influential to how I've learned. Um, Sarah Pritchard collaboration on questions of systems thinking and equity um, influences my thinking a lot. And my team member, Lindsay Pulaski, um, is a great thought partner here. So I wanna give them shout outs as well. So that's what I've got. I would love to open it up for questions, exploration, critiques, concerns, whatever, um, and chat. And I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see, you can see my face if nothing else. Thank you so much, Ellis. I, Janet and I were having an aside during your presentation about just how fascinating and interesting this is to think about. I mean, we, we like metaphors <laughs> as humans. We love simplifying things and, and making them a little more, I guess, easy to understand. Um, and so this might be a little bit of a, a provocative question to start out with, but would you recommend just throwing out the use of metaphors altogether? I, I can guess what your answer would be, but I just guess what you, how you'd respond to that. Yeah, you hope, hope yeah, probably guessing that I'll say, no, because it's impossible. And, um, and because that, that idea of sort of breaking down, simplifying, synthesizing is, is essential for this work. Anybody knows that if you say, okay, what we're going to do in this planning process for an advocacy campaign is spend the next three years understanding all the details of this puzzle to make sure we fully understand it so everybody is exactly um, in agreement about all the same facts. It's not going to work people are gonna resent you for it. And the world will change by the time you finish your analysis. So we need tools for shortcuts, simplifications, heuristics, ways of operating in this complex reality. But I think the practice that, that is really essential is saying, how do we not assume that that's the be all and end all? And if we come up with a metaphor, then that's solved. How do we continuously develop a practice of unpacking that language, interrogating our own assumptions? Um, whether through system modeling, system mapping, or other techniques. Um, that, that's sort of how I think about it in order to improve our impact. So. Perfect. Uh, so I know one of the areas that you have you know, some expertise and also that some of the work done by as a social system design lab um, is, is global. Um, and as we're thinking about metaphors, uh, what, what stories we think we all rely on that um, mean one thing that is highly, you know, contextual to a particular culture. I would um, just love for you to expand in any way that you care to about um, how this work relates to um, bringing people together around complex things when they don't necessarily share those same cultural cues. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot there, and I, I have thoughts on it, but I'm I'm not certainly not the sort of the be all and end all. Um, one of the so I, I mentioned in that presentation um, the work of Ihi Heke and and other folks in New Zealand, and a lot of their work um, is saying how are we promoting Maori ways of knowing in the context of health promotion, nutrition, exercise. And something that's really influenced my thinking over time in collaboration with um, colleagues and partners and reading and, and, and practicing this work is saying that when we, we I think academics in the United States um, operate as if the ways we speak, the frameworks in which we work are somehow sort of non-metaphorical, they are precise, they're technological, they're, they're, they're solid. Um, and part of what, what these folks say is that we all work through metaphors. And, and so these metaphors are not, that, that insight is not innovated by Lakoff and Johnson and Laird and, you know, it's not, it's not um, 
a new concept. These, these ideas, metaphors as ways of understanding and making sense of reality goes way back into forms of thought that are centuries and millennia. And so the question I think one is to say, how do we think about bi-directional metaphor understanding and learning and interrogation? And two, how do we think about the co-creation of metaphors? One of my um, uh, lines of work uh, and something I write a lot about is around how do we think about mapping and modeling across linguistic boundaries? Um, if we're thinking about drawing these causal loop diagrams and system maps, when some people who are part of this mapping or planning process speak English, some people speak Hindi, some people speak dialects of Hindi that don't have widely used written languages. Do we just defer to English as the dominant colonial language of the world? Or do we think about alternative ways of negotiating meaning through pictures, through drawings, um, through assigning symbolic meaning in the context of a conversation to variables that are based on the experience of people in the room who are negotiating it rather than sort of deferring to a framework or paradigm of, um, of English language and sort of dominance of, of Western thought. Um, so I have no idea if that answered your question, Janet, <laughs> but that's something I think about a lot is saying, what does it mean to sort of challenge this process? Not just to say it's a matter of imposing um, uh, tools of uh, American academia on others and say, folks need to learn our language in order to affect change. What does it mean to sort of start from a, a position of co-creation and negotiation and meaning making? So I, I actually have a question that maybe kind of ties into that a little bit, but just thinking about culture um, as a whole, but in, in the ever, I think you mentioned this, Alice, just the ever changing world that we live in and how culture is constantly shifting. Um, you know, this, this process of, you know, um, understanding complexities has to be iterative and you have to keep doing it. Uh, so what is your kind of, I guess, suggestion or um, how do you approach this work in a way that doesn't lead to burnout? Um, because I can imagine that having to, to go back to the map all the time, like that, that can be a lot um, when things change so, so, re or so readily. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. And, and you know, I get that challenge or that question from partners and from students to be like, so you're telling me I need to do this every time? And that's, uh, <laughs> hopefully that's not my general takeaway. But the way I, I like to sort of conceptualize this process is as a practice, as something that um, we are, we're developing the muscles for, <laughs> something that we are integrating as formal but also as sort of informal ways of being and knowing. A lot of the folks that I admire most, um, I'm gonna give a shout out to Jill Kuhlberg, who's another alum who sort of got me interested in all this work long, long ago. Um, think about these ideas of system modeling and mapping just as something you do reading the newspaper at breakfast, <laughs> something that you do as a way of trying to communicate with your partner, um, saying, how do we try to diagram? What's the situation we're working on here? Not because you're gonna then publish an academic paper on it, not because you have to write a medium post and then share to the world that this is my amazing insight, but because that day-to-day -day practice of working and um, using and reflecting um, builds the muscles, it, 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 it actually, I find, um, lowers the cognitive burden of trying to keep everything straight in my head because I can put it onto the paper. I can sort of distribute my cognition, to use a phrase, um, to what's drawn. Um, and yeah, so thinking about it not as sort of a, a formal process first, but more of an individual or a collective dialogue process that can be mobilized for formal analysis and planning. Um, and I think. No. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just thinking about, I mean, Jonesy reflected on this idea, um, I'm looking at the chat, <laughs> of the strength of metaphors is in the ability to adapt to new learning and thinking. And I think that that, that really resonates with me in the same sort of lens to say, what if 
you know, how do we sort of just develop this process of being creative with language? Um, what if we develop this practice with being creative with our own ways of thinking and, and interrogating it um, so that we can be nimble? Um, yeah. Yeah, this, this, um, I, I really appreciate that context and it um, kind of speaks to some of the notes I was taking about like, can we instill this, this practice early on? How early can we start instilling this, you know, um, abil ability and, and kind of desire to challenge and think through things a little bit more? Have you ever done any of this work? With with kiddos or with, or with younger uh, you know younger folks who who might benefit from getting this kind of earlier in their formative years. Yeah. <clears throat> so for many years, um, the social system design lab um, collaborated on on the hosting of a summer institute with teens um, that are sort of investing in systems thinking tools and capabilities for their own work, saying this is a, a skill building, muscle building thing that can really um, transform and change the way that, that teens think about the world and communicate with each other. Um, and there also a lot of our work is um, thinking about uh, how do we mobilize these tools as ways to involve and empower kids, little kids, in planning conversations as well. A colleague here at the Brown School, Jean-Francois Trani, is running a um, multi-year study in Afghanistan and Pakistan using these systems mapping tools as a, as a platform for community dialogue in, and community-based schools in both of those countries. Um, and I think that that's a lot of what's really exciting. There are also a number of organizations that are explicitly working on saying, how do we support um, systems thinking capabilities in youth. Two that come to mind are the Creative Learning Exchange and the Waters Center for Systems Transformation. I'm sorry, Waters Center. I don't remember all of it, but the Waters Center is the key point, um, who really are invested explicitly in those types of tools as well, which I think is really cool. I see some questions in the chat. Though. Yeah, I want to elevate one of those coming to us from Thomas. He's mm -hmm. asking you to put on your, your hat as director of the Social System Design Lab and just at, kind of asking what's in the future for the lab. Um, what are you guys looking to do or possibly expand into? So mm -hmm. anything you want to say about the lab? Yeah. Um, so the as you can imagine from the photos, and this gets to um, Sherry's question, Sherry, Sherry, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, about virtual collaboration. As you can imagine, COVID and virtual remote work completely upended and threw into the air sort of underlying assumptions of how we work. And that's been, I think, really exciting and super challenging. <laughs> um, and one of the things that it, that it sort of forced thinking front and center is to say, how do we not think about um, sort of a central node of the Brown School as being the, the, the fountain of innovation and practice leadership. What does it mean to um, think about this, what this idea of a social system design lab is not being a institution where everybody's employed by the institution, but also a confederation of practitioners who are contributing to advancing this work. So I pulled up these five friends here in St. Louis who are doing this work because I think about the work of the Social System Design Lab as learning from and supporting and participating in this larger ecosystem, this larger network of, of practitioners. And I think that that's the sort of an underlying principle of, of where do we go. I think the other thing that um, is a real contribution or a, a real important direction is saying, how do we really emphasize um, capabilities for translation of the, the systems tools to practical applied uses of professionals. Um, so how do we just emphasize and continue to dive into developing exemplars, to developing examples and tools for like, how actually might I use these modeling tools for evaluation design? How might I use these tools for um, strategy and community organizing. Um, and that requires dialogue, right? It's not just sort of me sitting here in Hillman Hall figuring it out. It's it's through working it out in practice. But um, those are two two big picture directions, but they imply a bunch of other things. 
Great. That actually um, kind of leads nicely into another question that we received from Aaron, who's wondering if, if you might have tools for folks who are wanting to facilitate creating these maps with audiences and facilitating these conversations around these maps. And, and maybe it, it involves taking a course, but are there other things at the lab or you envision having readily available for folks? Yeah, so um, it's always dangerous to make commitments to things on webinars, <laughs> um, but, but um, something that we're, we're working on now, and I, I put the link to the methods briefs, and like I said, there's more that are coming up um, they're live, but they're just not linked, um, is really saying, how do we become more maybe radically transparent about our tools? I'm um, saying Brown School Education is, is immensely valuable, and there's a lot of things you can learn, and that dedicated time to unpack this work is um, in an academic space is awesome, and it's wonderful. I'm a product of it, and I've, I've learned from it. But how do we also say, there's nothing sacred, there's nothing proprietary that, you know, that says the only way you should have access to sort of practice insights and guidance that come out of this is that you take a 15 week class. Um, and so uh, part of where we're moving is saying just creating practice tools, guidance, briefs, materials to share more widely. Um, and also I'm looking at you, Jenna, because we talked about this, um, thinking about also finding new platforms um, to to create alternate avenues for teaching and learning and collaboration as well. Um, so a little bit vague, but, but those are things I, I wrestle with. That's what keeps me, me up at night, <laughs> those questions. So uh, not solved, but uh, yeah, so, so those tools. And then I mentioned, I can put in the chat um, some of the resources as well that I think do a really nice job, especially working with youth. Um, if you look them up, they have some cool things there too. Wonderful. Hopefully this is not gonna be a keep you up at night question. Uh, but as you were speaking before about, uh, it, it made sense, again, it is a metaphor to build the muscle of how you think about metaphor, how you think about um, the meaning that's conveyed. And I think back on the image that you shared of immigration as a tidal wave um, and all the negative uh, negativity associated with that, the, the fear, the lack of control, et cetera. So, uh, question that I'm curious about is, you know, for your, for yourself personally, when you're, you know, pretty attuned to, okay, here's the meaning that somebody's pulling in because of the story they're telling. If you don't agree or you find it harmful um, in the moment, you know, at your best, we all have the, oh, darn, I should have, but at your best, what, how do you challenge or reframe um, Th that use of metaphor to, mm -hmm. to bring the conversation to a place that you think is more justice oriented or fairer? Or... That's a great question. And I, I don't, that's something I'm, I'm working on and learning <laughs> in that moment. Um, uh, but I think that um, one way that I think about it is to actually take that posture of saying, let's unpack that you know, what is implied by this metaphor? What is implied by this use of language? Um, and, and this is what I'm hearing about that use of language. Is that what is being communicated here? Because I think that two things. One is I think there's a lot of value in that exploration that unpacking that dialogue to say, when I hear this word, this is what it communicates to me. And this is why that matters, right? Which is different than you said this and this is what you believe, but it's saying when I hear that, that's, that's the implication of it. So the decentering um, the, the conflict to the metaphor rather than the person. And then the second one is to say, so, so I think that's, that's how I think about it. I don't always do it, but that's what I think about it. Um, and um, the other side of it is to say that sometimes unpacking the mental model affirms the, the, the implications, right? So, so sometimes, sometimes it's saying, oh, I'm using this word and it connotes all these things and that's not actually what I believe. Other times people use violent words in explicitly violent ways. And I think that that's a much harder nut to crack to use metaphorical language. <laughs> um, uh, to say, how do we think about that transformation? And I don't think that's something that happens, and it happens in a moment, but I do think it can be something that happens over time in terms of sustained engagement and dialogue um, that may employ these tools, but are not solved by those tools. Um, and Elaine, I'm seeing your point. Um, 
the use of metaphors reinforces structural and cultural forces that create and reinforce racial inequality. So, you know, what I would argue is that we use metaphors for good and for ill. And that's just a way that we are wrestling with, uh, this is my position, this is the way that we make sense of reality. And they can be employed uh, violently, <laughs> they can be employed for sort of unpacking learning, healing, and dialogue. The creation of new metaphors can be potentially transformative because of the ways that it might shift mental models. And so, so that's a, so yeah, I think I really resonate with that reflection and, and maybe the question then that's implied by just saying, what does that practice look like? And I think that's a really exciting set of ideas to explore. And so Aditi, how can we recognize strategic uses of language, labels or narratives versus un or misinformed uses? Ooh, <laughs> I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, if I'm honest. I, you know, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a, an old saw, I think is the idiom that people use. Um, there's a phrase of um, a, uh, around this in system dynamics, but also in other forms of modeling. It says all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the premise is all of our mental models, all of our formal models, all of our mathematical wrong models are simplifications, um, alighting, they, they, they're incomplete. That's just by nature. Models are simplifications of reality. Um, but the question is, how, uh, how are those employed? And so, you know, so, so I, I what, the reason I'm pausing is I, I wrestle with that question of like, what does it mean to um, think about sort of uninformed versus informed when, when one of the underlying ideas is all of these are flawed, incomplete, can be improved, whether malicious or, be, or beneficial. Um, so, but yeah, it's something to keep on chewing on. I think it's a really awesome question. In the last couple minutes that we have, and thank you so much, Ellis, for um, all that you've shared. I think you've given everyone, myself included, a lot to think about as we leave. And so I'm wondering, um, as we do all return to our work, um, to the institutions and organizations that we're a part of, um, we may be thinking, hey, what can I do um, to maybe start conversations around this? So what would be your you know, call to action or you know, a small thing that we could we could start with, and maybe that's a, a loaded question, but something that we could start with. <laughs> um, I think I think probably this, the call to action is to um, build the muscles about reflecting, exploring, um, unpacking your own use of language and what you're hearing in the world, which I think is very different than policing or correcting or um, um, confronting use of language, but to build those muscles to say, what are the implications? Um, what are the connotations? What does this say about my own worldview um, in using this? And is this what I want to communicate? Because I think that, that that is a really foundational idea about what does it mean to build empathy? What does it mean to um, invite opportunities for dialogue? Um, and I think that that's useful, again, no matter if you're using mapping and modeling as a practice, or just this is something that you do as part of your own way of existing in the world. Um, yeah. Well, Ellis, I hope you are seeing the chat right now, because there are some very kind comments from our audience that, that this program was a gift and um, that, that their audience is grateful. We are grateful that they are with us. Um, we are, you know, at time, we can make an hour go by so very quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering is, if there's a final word or thought that you want to, you know, leave this group with today. Yeah, I mean, I guess the final thought is um, there's a lot of, lot to dig into, a lot of opportunities to learn and practice. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a, I have a hat of just like a person in the world and of a researcher and a community collaborator, but also a teacher. And I think that, um, if you're interested in coming to the Brown School, uh, there's a lot of really cool opportunities to wrestle with these ideas in practice, get involved um, in research, um, bring this work and translate it to practicum applications, get involved with the folks I mentioned and many others who are doing this work. And so I think, you know, encourage people to sort of lean into those opportunities. Um, and I'm always happy to uh, chat with people if they've got questions or ideas. I can't promise I'll be super prompt. 
<laughs> with anybody, but I'm always happy to chat, chat with those ideas as well. Very nice. Well, as a teacher, thank you for teaching in our open classroom. Really have enjoyed interacting with this audience. I think all of us have been left with a lot to think about. Sarah, thank you so much for being an awesome co-host. Um, and so everybody, we're going to call this program to a close and hope that we get to see you again at another open classroom very soon. And until then, please stay healthy and safe out there, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye now. Thanks, everyone.